Okay, so Matthew eleven twenty five. 25, um, we can put ourselves in this one. It says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you concealed these things from the sophisticated and educated and revealed them to ordinary folks. How many ordinary folks we got? <laughs> Aren't you glad? You didn't need a PhD in order to uh, qualify to become a Christian? Yeah, thank God. You know, and it's really ironic, but when you get a master's degree in theology, it's called an MDiv. Anybody know what the doctorate's called? A D-min. <laughs> Sounds kind of close to demon. It's a doctor and minister. Couldn't they come up with a better name than that than D-min? But look, be careful. That's all I'm saying. Just be careful. I'm not against education, but... Uh, he kept it from the sophisticated people and revealed it to the ordinary folks. And then in Timothy it says, I'm deeply grateful. Who's speaking now? This is Paul, okay? I'm deeply grateful to our Lord for trusting me enough to appoint me his minister despite the fact that I had previously blasphemed his name. That's a man who fell on the rock. He was humbled. I had previously blasphemed his name, persecuted his church, and damaged his cause. I believe he was merciful to me. Can we say that? We should all say this out loud together. I believe he was merciful to me because what I did was done in the ignorance of a man without faith. <laughs> See, he had lots of knowledge, but no faith. He didn't understand relationship with God. He didn't understand God as a father. He was an orphan trying to earn his way into the love of God. I don't even know if they would have called it love. They said you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but it was more so you wouldn't be punished. It's what religion does. And God say, no, pull back the veil and come in and spend time with me as a father. Fall in love with me. Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't if you're worried that you're going to get pounced on and get beaten by your father. You need to see him as a loving father who wants you to grow. That picture of Jesus just reaching down and pulling you up. Have you heard the term scaffolding? Ever hear me talk about that? Yes. It's a learning technique that teachers learn sometimes. And, and what they tell the teachers is picture a building that's got 10 floors on it. And it's got scaffolding on the outside, right? And the construction workers are going up and down on the outside of the building on the scaffolding. Suppose there was somebody on the eighth floor that had to pass a tool down to somebody on the second floor. And it was, let's say, a power drill. Would they drop it? From the eighth floor? Why not? Because they killed a guy on the second floor, right? What would they have to do? You're either going to ask the guy underneath on the second floor to climb up to you, or you're going to walk down to them. And this is the beauty of a brilliant teacher. They can meet you right where you're at. They can size up where you are and give you the exact tool you need to get you from where you are to the next level. That's why that picture's so powerful, because he's reaching down to you. You're at one place. I'm at a different place. But he's reaching down to both of us right where we are to take us up another level. And sometimes something else has to die in order for us to move higher. If you want to go up in a hot air balloon, they get rid of stuff. They drop off the weights, and they turn up the heat, and they go higher. Same with us. We've got to evict some of that old baggage, right? All right, so I'm, I'm almost done. So there's this last parable that he uses, and parables are like this, but they're multifaceted. That's the beauty. So I'll just give you an overview of a different parable just quickly to make the point. So you're with Jesus, and it's Luke chapter 15. It's verse 1, and it says that Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, okay? So let's just say they're over here. The tax collectors and sinners are over here. Over on this side was another group of people called the Pharisees. And they were looking at Jesus with the tax collectors and sinners. And what were they thinking? What a lowlife loser Jesus is. I can't believe we're here, the high and mighty people, the knowledgeable people, and he's hanging out with those lowlifes. And now these people are over here going, boy, Jesus is pretty cool. Those religious people are over there, but he wants to be with us. And if you look at the language, it's even better than that because it says the tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus. Never says they were drawn to the Pharisees because religion doesn't draw people. It shames people. But relationship 
has a way of loving the sinner without condoning the sin. You can still hate the sin, but love the sinner. These religious folks just couldn't do it. They didn't know how to do that. Now Jesus is over here, and he decides to tell a parable. And it's a complex one. And it's like a funnel. I heard Eugene Peterson teach it this way. He said it's like a funnel. He tells a story, and the first one is, a man has 100 sheep, he loses one, and he leaves the 99 and goes to find the one. When he comes back, he throws a party. Then a woman has 10 coins. See how the funnel's coming down? 100 to 1, now 10 to 1. Has 10 coins, loses one, sweeps the house, finds it, and, and does what? Throw a party. Comes down. A man has two sons. Loses one, right? The, the prodigal son left and he spent all the money. Loses one, finds him, and then throws a party. But then there's two brothers out of the two. The one that was found, but then there's the older brother. And he's not happy that, that dad's throwing a party, is he? No. Why not? He didn't earn it. The younger brother didn't earn it. And I did. So why are you throwing him a party and not me? Now look at the brilliance of this story. So here's Jesus. He knows that these are the people that they should be coming and approaching. He's modeling to the Pharisees what God wants is to hang out with the poor and the broken and the tax collectors and sinners. He said to them in a whole different place, these people are getting into the kingdom before you. How hard is that for them to grasp? How could that be? Not hard for us to grasp in the New Testament, though, is it? We can understand that. But he not only loves the broken, he loves the Pharisees. But they have armor on. Their knowledge is like armor. So he has to find a brilliant lock combination. How do I get behind the armor of their intellect? I could tell a story, and I could show them, ultimately, that they're the older brother who's standing outside while the father throws a party for the outcasts. But he never had to say that, did he? No. So he walks away, and the Pharisee's going, hey, wait a minute, he was talking about us. But he's already gone. See, but now what you do with that is up to you. And that's where conviction comes in. So when the Lord shows you something that you need to change, don't run from it. It's an act of love. Because none of us are perfect. He wants us to keep moving higher. He's got that arm out saying, come on. It's been given to you to know the mystery of God is that there's always going to be more to know about the Father. And I want to take you higher. You're never going to arrive where there's not more that you can know. And it, it's going to show in the way you live your life. You look like you're losing your attention span, so I'm going to go a little faster. So Matthew 21 tells another parable. You probably know this one too. It says a king throws a, a wedding feast for his son, and he invites all the wealthy people in the area. Only in verse 5 it says, the invited guests were not impressed. <laughs> one was preoccupied with his business, another went off to farming, and the rest seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. This infuriated the king, so he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their city burned to the ground. The king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, yet those who had been invited to attend didn't deserve the honor. Now I want you to go into the streets and the alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in the honor of my son. Now that you're a Christian, I guess it's pretty easy to see what he's talking about here, right? The people who were invited to the feast were the Pharisees. They didn't see it as a feast because it was too hard. The G-force just knocked them out. Too hard for them to understand that this is my calling to go to tax collectors and sinners. And yet these people, Jesus said, are entering the kingdom before you. So now... He says, go out to the alleys, the highways and the byways, and find those and bring them. How many, how many of you were found in a highway or a byway? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If we told the stories of how ruined our lives were because of the sin, and that he never, uh, he chased me down. He fights till I'm found. He leaves the 99. It's a reckless love. He, he took a chance to come and find me in the mess that I was in. And, and nobody is too far away from him that he won't reach them. The worst sin is not too hard for God. It's so exciting to me. So 
I want you to go into the streets and the alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. So the servants went out into the city and invited everyone to come to the wedding feast, good and bad alike, until the banquet hall was what? Crammed with people. Now the king entered the banquet hall and he looked with glee over all his guests. Just spend a minute there. He's looking at all of us here and he remembers where we were when he found us and he's looking at us with glee right now and he's saying, you know what? You dress up pretty nice. (laughs) Even the baby agreed with that. (laughs) Unbelievable what the transition is in our lives. And now we're at the wedding. But then there's this difficult part to understand. Then he noticed a guest who was not wearing the wedding robe that was provided for him. Now, this is the Passion Translation, and not every verse says it that way in other translations, but it's an important thing. It says the wedding garment that was provided for him. So we are given a wedding garment on the way in. There's a certain way we're expected to behave when we're in the kingdom, right? So you don't just get in, and now you keep on sinning and just do whatever you want. Anything goes. No, that makes the Father unhappy. You were invited, but there's a certain set of rules and standards for your good, not just because he's mean and he wants to restrict us. Because the next part is hard to understand, isn't it? He said, my friend, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing what? Your wedding garment. But the man was speechless. And then the king turned to his servants and said, tell him, I'm sorry, tie him up and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be great sorrow with weeping and grinding of teeth. So look, this doesn't mean that God's a mean God. It means that there's a a minimum standard that he needs us to live up to as his sons and his daughters. That's not a bad thing, okay? You call yourself a Christian. You're not perfect. It doesn't mean you're never going to sin again. But David was a man after God's own heart. See, so all of us can be men and women that are after God's heart. If you know that you're intentionally living with a sin and in a sinful relationship and say, well, the grace of God is that he has to just forgive me, that will be an example of not wearing the garment and saying, no, I'm sorry. The reason this kingdom matters is because there are boundaries that he gives us and that by living within those boundaries, you flourish. If you try to knock down all the boundaries, then you're not in his kingdom. So you've got to wear his garment. And look, I'm not getting legalistic about it. It's in the Word. What else, what else would it be in here for? Not to show you that he's mean. It's that, look, this is a war that we're in. And we can't go lightly. We can't be halfway Christians. We've got to be either all in or not in. And, and all in for all of us just means a man and woman after God's own heart.